Good morning. Uh, welcome to everyone to this year's Civil Society and Think Tank Forum. My name is Valeska Esch and I'm Deputy Executive Director of the Aspen Institute Germany. And I would like to thank you so much for your high interest. We were quite overwhelmed and have over 300 registrations to this event. And I would like to thank every single one of you for taking the time, especially our speakers, moderators and working group facilitators. We really look forward to the next two days and the second part of the forum in July. And I would like to thank the German Federal Chancellery and the German Foreign Office for entrusting the Espen Institute Germany together with Southeast Europe Association with this important endeavor and for their support in the process. I would also like to thank our friends and partners of Southeast Europe Association, Dr. Hans-Jörg Brey and Dr. Christian Hagemann for the again excellent cooperation. The Espen Institute Germany is a transatlantic institute which has had a strong focus on the Western Balkans since the early 1990s and working with civil society from across the Western Balkans has always been an essential part of our activities. It therefore really is an honor to have the opportunity to host the Civil Society and Think Tank Forum, a process that I have closely followed and participated in over the past years, although under very different circumstances, and I am sure we all miss meeting each other in person. It goes without saying that we would have loved to host all of you in person in Berlin, and we try to include as much as possible also opportunities to network and exchange contact details in this platform. It is worth checking out all of the different functions and creating a profile as this platform will remain open throughout the next weeks. And the second part of this year's Civil Society and Think Tank Forum will take place on July 5th on this very platform. And Hans-Jörg will share more details about this later. While the panels will be recorded and can be rewatched also here on this platform, this is not true for the working groups as they will take place under Chatham House rule and are designed for all of you to be able to get together and work jointly in a closed environment. As you have seen in the agenda, we have reserved quite some time for all of you to get together in 10 different working groups to be able to address your issues of expertise in smaller groups. These working groups are facilitated by think tanks from the region and I would like to use this opportunity to thank all facilitators for the work and efforts they have been putting into the preparations. You may wonder why the working groups and what happens with the results. As in previous years, we are working on feeding the results of the civil society and think tank forum into the political preparations of the Berlin process. To that end, the facilitators of all working groups will ensure that the results of your joint work are saved and we will publish a declaration of the civil society and think tank forum based on those working group results. And we will spread it and I would like to invite all of you to use your channels and to spread it as widely as possible. And I would like to also thank European Western Balkans, which have agreed to serve as media partner for this event and will help us spread the messages. We will also send the declaration to our government. We will further be able to send two delegates of the Civil Society and Think Tank Forum to the Foreign Ministers Meeting, which is taking place next week. They will present some of the key messages of this forum also based on the results of your work in the working groups. We will also send the results to our Minister of Economic Affairs and Energy, Peter Altmaier, and have organized a background meeting between the facilitators of the five working groups relevant to the Economic Minister's Meeting and the head of the division which is who is preparing the Minister's Meeting. And finally, finally, the results of this first Civil Society and Think Tank Forum will be the basis of the discussions at the second Civil Society and Think Tank Forum, which will take place, as I said, on July 5th, before and in parallel to the summit on this very platform. As you can see, your work over the next two days is going to directly have an impact on the forum's results and will feed into the political processes. I therefore wish all of us interesting discussions, a productive work environment, and I look forward to the next two days. And before I hand over to my colleague Hans-Jörg Brey, I would like to thank Yannick Remme and the rest of our team for this amazing job and all of the work that especially Yannick has put into realizing this forum. And now Hans-Jörg, over to you. Thank you, Valeska. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, welcome to the Civil Society and Think Tank Forum One in the context of the Berlin process, also from the side of Southeast Europe Association. My name is Hans Jörg Brey. I'm the Executive Director of Southeast Europe Association. The Berlin process has finally returned to Berlin, and we are pleased and proud to have the opportunity to contribute in shaping preparing and performing this year's event. We would have very much liked to host you in person here in Berlin, as Valeska already said, 
Unfortunately, the ongoing pandemic has frustrated our optimistic scenarios as concerns the possibility of meeting face to face. Once having accepted this bitter reality, we have all tried our utmost to set up a virtual space that allows the transfer of knowledge, concentrated work, the development of new ideas, and also networking to the greatest extent possible. I will explain the spaces and tools available at our conference platform a bit later. Let me first express some words of thanks also on behalf of the Board of Southeast Europe Association and its president, Manuel Sarazin. Our special gratitude goes to the German Federal Foreign Office for generously supporting this event. The Federal Foreign Office together with the Federal Chancellery have been the driving forces in the Berlin process from the very beginning. The active participation of Minister of State Michael Roth and Secretary of State Miguel Berger, from Alexander Jung representing the Federal Chancellery, as well as from State Secretary Claudia Dörr-Voss from the German Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy, reflect the high appreciation and expectations of the German federal government for the Berlin process and for this event. A very cordial welcome to all representatives from all the important and prestigious national and international institutions who provide their input and insights in the panel discussions and also to the many representatives from civil society and think tanks from the region. Our engage your engagement is definitely at the very core of this process. It is you who have to do the majority of the work here today and tomorrow and the time to follow. A very special thanks to our dear colleagues from the Aspen Institute Germany. Cooperating with them is always an experience of a creative partnership among friends. Thanks to Valeska Esch and to Yannick Remme for the hard work and experience they have invested in making this project happen. A great thank you also goes to my colleague Christian Hagemann, Deputy Director of Southeast Europe Association. This year's events in the context of the Berlin process constitute the second major conference project that we from the Southeast Europe Association carry through in close cooperation with the Aspen Institute Germany. I know that many of our participants from the expert community from international organizations and from civil society have already participated in our international conference on young people migration and the demographic challenge in the Western Balkans under the German presidency to the Council of the European Union in October 2020. One of the leading actors last year's conference has been minister of last year's conference has been Minister of State Michael Roth, who will address you on behalf of the federal government in a minute. Mr. Roth has always been a most dedicated supporter of our engagement with civil society and especially the young generation from the Western Balkans. Some brief information on the work on mission of the Southeast Europe Association. We constitute a probably unique network of about 700 members, most of them experts from the Southeast European region including the Western Balkans and an area of 10 more countries ranging from Hungary down southeast to Moldova and Turkey. Our experts come from a wide range of backgrounds from academia, think tanks, politics, administration, business, international institutions, the media, culture, and very importantly, the civil society. Civil society from the region and the international expert community are definitely the backbone of our ample activities. Our activities focus on many of the topics that will be discussed in depth in the panels and working groups today and tomorrow. Recently, we have started with a special focus with workshops on the green agenda for the Western Balkans. You can learn more about our activities when visiting our profile on the conference platform or our website. Let me in the end, once again, invite you to make wide use of the many creative tools at your disposal on our online platform. You will see that we have made a lot of efforts to render this online conference and the follow-up event most interactive and memorable ones. 
Allow me to give you briefly some highlights of our platform's many features. The central document in the platform is certainly the agenda that is continuously updated. You can use the heart button next to the agenda points to build your own schedule. You can access all panels and working groups through the agenda and by navigating to the Messe Berlin building um, or the office building respectively. You can create your own profile to connect with other participants, chat, and exchange contact details throughout the forum. You will find conference papers as a background reading for the working groups in the library. They provide ample food for thought for the working groups and for your work beyond that. You can network and meet up with other participants in the cafe, actually in different separate spaces. Try and find out the most creative features of this new tool. You can leave your ideas and comments on the conference on the future of Europe by clicking on the plane that is flying over the main square. If you have trouble to navigate through the platform, you can find instructions and tips on how to use all the features of this platform in the library. The second civil society and think tank forum on July 5 will also take place on this platform as Valeska has already mentioned. So it's worth to invest a few minutes in creating a profile to collect connections and explore the other features. Also, please save your login credentials in order to, to reuse them in a few weeks. Following these technical remarks, I give the floor to Minister of State of, for Europe from the German Federal Foreign Office who will address the audience with a video message on behalf of the federal government. I'm looking forward to fruitful discussions and concrete results today and tomorrow. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, participants in the Civil Society and Think Tank Forum, dear all, good morning. Let me start by congratulating the South East Europe Association and the Aspen Institute Germany on the organization of this very important forum, which also opens the 2021 edition of the Berlin Process. The organizers have virtually brought together an impressive selection of representatives of civil society, think tanks and academia of the six Western Balkan countries it's my pleasure and honor to address such a high quality audience. The Civil Society Forum is to some extent the true essence of the Berlin process as such. You, the citizens of the Western Balkans, are the ultimate target group and the main beneficiaries, as well as the first sufferers in case of failure of regional cooperation, connectivity, and infrastructure projects and the EU integration path of the region. When we politicians work on political agreements, the key question should always be, how can we actually improve everyday life for everyone? Regional cooperation does exactly that. A practical example, in exactly one month from today, the regional roaming agreement will allow all of you to use internet and be connected no matter where you travel in the Balkans without the so far extremely high roaming costs. More broadly speaking, initiatives such as the regional common market are what drives economic growth and they will contribute to more investment and more jobs in the whole region again with the aim to provide concrete improvements and perspectives for people. They also strengthen the EU perspective of EU countries. If you look at the forum's agenda, people are at the center of each topic of discussion. Reconciliation, democratization, digitalization, free media, environment and sustainable development share the common aim of improving life standards and conditions of all citizens. Germany, as the initiate uh, main promoter of the Berlin process, 
will always be on your side to mainstream the goal of democratic space and strengthen the role of civil society in the region. External partners can, as good friends, make suggestions and provide the room for discussion. It's, however, up to you to decide on your future and shape the relationships with your neighbors. That's why I encourage all participants to share your experiences, use your critical thinking and your creativity to make a wide set of proposals. What you will debate today and tomorrow will be an integral input also for the coming political meetings and the summit on the 5th of July. Next week, at the foreign ministers meeting, a small delegation from your forum will have the opportunity to present what you all will be working on together over the next one and a half days. I would like to add a few words on the role of civil society in general. It's a message I repeat again and again, because I firmly believe it. An active and engaged civil society is a crucial element of healthy democracies. Bottom-up control of government's policies is not a nice-to-have thing, but the main pillar of democratic stability. And in the specific context of the Western Balkans, people-to-people -people cooperation is the most powerful tool to overcome the legacies from the past and promote sound reconciliation. The debate we have been witnessing over the past weeks concerning a non-paper suggesting dangerous border changes in the Western Balkans along ethnic lines reminds us that nationalism and divisive rhetoric are still a temptation in the region. Like a clock, echoes of division and inciting speech periodically test our unity. We have to firmly stand against any narratives of hatred that brought wars and mass killings to the heart of Europe. Solidarity, respect and collaboration among people both inside and among your respective countries, are the best vaccine against the spreading of nationalistic ideas that only foster division and would take the region away from EU core values. The citizens of the Western Balkan countries are therefore called to an active political engagement to set the basis for democratic initiatives in the entire region. This is particularly true for younger people who often naturally champion EU values, especially those who spend part of their study years in Berlin, Paris, Rome and many other European cities thanks to the Erasmus program. The outbreak of the COVID-19 emergency coincided with a further slowdown, if not a complete halt of reforms in some Western Balkan countries restrictive laws, clientelistic ownership structures and budget cuts burden media freedom. Violence against journalists remains a big concern. In some cases, we see clear signs of democratic backsliding in more and more polarized political environments. Civil society engagement can help tackle these issues and put the Western Balkans back on the right track. What we are doing in this forum must become the guiding principle. Citizens and civil society organizations must be included in an open dialogue with local authorities to discuss possible solutions and find the best way forward. This is essential for the further EU integration of the region because the transformation of the countries is a task for the whole society. Dear friends, let me conclude. By working together, we can ensure democratic and inclusive societies and strengthen the EU perspective of the region. And I'm very glad to see that this spirit is taking root here at the Civil Society Forum. I wish you the best of luck for the work of panels and working groups. We are curious about your suggestions and proposals. 
State Secretary Mike Miguel Berger is looking forward to discuss them with you tomorrow. Thank you so much for your commitment. Thank you for having me. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, State Minister Roth, uh, for this video message and for the encouragement to the civil society to be creative and critical to what uh, the governments in the region are doing and push on variety of issues ranging from reconciliation to digitalization and, uh, and environment. Uh, dear participants, warm welcome, at least virtually, from Berlin on the working part of the Civil Society and Think Tank Forum. I guess I can speak on behalf of all the participants. We would rather be physically present in Berlin, landing on the new airport, finally. However, the current circumstances do not uh, allow that due to the COVID-19 uh, uh, restrictions. Uh, today, this morning, I have a pleasure to moderate the introductory panel entitled Eight Years of the Berlin Process, Achievements and Outlooks. The panel will last for an hour. I will try to devote half of the time for questions from the audience, as there are more than uh, 130 participants online at the moment. I would ask for your patience if you pose a question to, to go through the list and, uh, and uh, uh, ask your specific question. Uh, each panelist will receive an opening question and one additional follow-up question. They need to uh, be answered in approximately uh, seven to, to, to eight minutes. In regards to the other housekeeping rules, the audience can pose a question. Uh, in the Q&A uh, section or raise hand or use the raise hand option at the bottom of your screens. Okay, so today we have an excellent lineup of, of speakers uh, on the panel, uh, starting with Alexander Jung, Deputy Head of, of Division from the uh, German Federal Chancellery, responsible for let's say Western Balkans among uh, other parts of uh, other parts of, of Europe and uh, Asia. Next in line is uh, Michela uh, Matuela, acting director at uh, the DG Near, uh, responsible for the Western Balkans. Third, speakers, third speaker in line is Tanya Miscevic, Deputy Secretary General uh, at the RCC, the Regional Cooperation Council. And last but not least, uh, our own Alexandra Tomanich, the Executive Director of the European Fund uh, for, the, for the Balkans. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my opening question for Alexander would be more of a general nature, uh, and it goes more in direction of uh, the German Chancellery satisfaction of the outcomes from the Berlin process. Did it produce uh, the, the envisaged uh, result? Uh, from the side of the of the chan chancellery when the process was uh, initiated a couple of years ago. So, Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Zoran, and yeah, a warm welcome to everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. It is also a very timely manner of organizing that. So also from my side, compliments to Aspen Südosteuropa Gesellschaft, because indeed we are looking forward to your feed in, to your um, comments, to your input, to what you want to tell us, what uh, should also be discussed and what you think uh, is the important part about this year's conferences. And I'm not only speaking about the summit, because we are now starting today having quite a series of events. And of course, also in the last weeks, um, there has been uh, lots of thinking about uh, what to do with this year's um, summit and with all the other meetings. But now is a very crucial time. So um, yeah, already compliments for the time and the organization. Coming to your question. Um, what are the the um, what is the level of satisfaction for the level of satisfaction i guess one should first have a look at which goals were there and what have we concretely achieved 
when the process was started seven years ago, the rough out sketch of the first conference, which of course also then led to what happened in the next conferences, was, um, if I can summarize it, of course, it is always about more, but uh, there were four main goals which were, which were mentioned very often, which is working on bilateral problems, um, trying to get to a level of reconciliation in the region, improving the regional economic cooperation, and also contributing to sustainable growth in the region. So when one looks at these fields, and we look now where we stand now, I um, would have a very long list of uh, things of concrete um, achievements of concrete agreements in some um, uh, areas of uh, concrete implementation in some other areas. And I am, of course, risking um, by um, mentioning some of them to leave out some other important ones, but still I would like to, to try to summarize it uh, briefly in the time you gave to me. <laughs> so on um, the economic field, I think it is very much worthwhile mentioning, starting from the end, the agreement last year on establishing a common regional market after all the efforts which were done for, for that before. I think this is really an agreement which is very important and which is also pointing into the future and where I assume uh, Tanya Miscevic will also be able to speak about because there I see a very positive role of the RCC and of SEFTA in promoting this. So um, that is also summing up some of the initiatives which have started before, but I should also, of course, mention in the economical field, the infrastructure pro projects, which were in several fields, traffic, energy, also many of them focusing on um, sustainable projects, on renewables. There is the investment in, into digital infrastructure. There is the investment form of chambers of commerce, which um, came out of the process. There is the already mentioned roaming agreement. And uh, therefore, I think there is quite a list of things which have been already achieved and also some things where very good plans have been developed. On the political side, um, of course, also the economic is political, but uh, speaking about reconciliation, I would very much like to mention RICO, not only because they produced uh, the very good logo, as I find. So uh, it is a very concrete uh, result of the process as well, where one can see that uh, quickly um, there is now um, a cooperation among young people with a structure, with many exchanges, which many projects going on also now in that time of the pandemic. So um, we um, have with RICO, I think, really a very good uh, setup for um, having cooperation of the young generation, which is crucial and which therefore I think one cannot mention enough because also um, it is uh, setting up such an organization is something uh, which of course is not easy um, in a setup where one has uh, six participants and everybody has interests. And therefore I think that was really also a great, a great achievement. Um, we have more agreements. We have declarations on bilateral issues, on missing persons. We had um, on the uh, um, small and light weapons an initiative. We have cooperation on anti-corruption. So in the field of political uh, cooperation, also um, quite many uh, agreements have been taken. I also, um, and they are now coming to assess to the assessment, would of course like to say that regional cooperation um, cannot end with setting up such a process. So um, regional cooperation has a very high potential with everything which uh, has been agreed, which uh, the starting points which uh, we have identified uh, with uh, the several initiatives which um, also were born around the Berlin process. I would therefore say it is a very good process. It is a process that delivered results. And it is a process which shows us the potential that regional cooperation has. And that's where, where we should uh, take it up. OK, the, but the, the context and the circumstances did not significantly change compared with the period when the Berlin process uh, was initiated. Back then, the Commission was, uh, at least in statement of, of President Juncker, was against any further enlargement. 
uh, now we have a more optimistic commission and the president of the commission, but the advancement in the enlargement process is stuck uh, in the council. So having in mind, having this in mind, the question would not be in direction of uh, further enlargement, but is there going to be a continuation of the Berlin process next year in this or some other formats? And you please, if you can elaborate a bit more on this. Yeah, so first to say, um that on enlargement, I would very much like to leave the, <laughs> leave the lead also to, to the commission here. Um, but um, coming, to, coming to your question, uh, I think first one, uh, there's one thing I would like to say about enlargement because sometimes one hears the question, is it uh, now the Berlin process uh, or regional cooperation? Is it a substitute uh, for the enlargement or is it maybe also because of all these offers of regional cooperation that enlargement isn't coming forward? And there I would my clear answer would be it is not the case like that, because as a matter of fact, um, all the countries, of course, have their own merits principle based approach to getting nearer to the European Union to fulfilling the European perspective. But then there is also some part where I actually see that with regional cooperation, all of them have such a big gain, be it in the economical part, but being also in achieving together um, progress on reconciliation, which prepares them to be better equipped to actually come forward uh, towards the European Union. So therefore, this is the connex I see here, that uh, actually regional cooperation is a big plus for each country. And therefore, um, that, uh, that is something where um, I, I cannot subscribe to, to such an argument of saying maybe in the last years um, enlargement um, has not uh, taken the steps forward that uh, some people, um, that many people were wishing for. So um, for the future of the process, I cannot give you a definite answer on what will be the setup and how regional cooperation will be taken up. So to be very honest there, um, it is something which uh, is being, of course, discussed where everybody who um, I hear from tells me um, that the big pluses they see from the process are amongst others, the regional ownership, which is there, it is that it's um, a, a process which in its informal way has uh, been able to produce uh, some results, some agreements, uh, which in more formal processes have not been able to, um, to, to come through in that way. And um, that uh, regional cooperation, of course, is something where, as I said in my initial remarks, um, that is nothing which uh, which stops uh, now, so that in, in some way needs to be taken forward. But I cannot give you a more definite answer on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, that is also an answer that, that I was satisfied with. Uh, Michaela, um, my question towards the engineer, the, the commission in general is, uh, has the commission seen the added value? And if you can elaborate how, of this intergovernmental process, which is specifically devoted to the Western Balkan. Why I'm asking this question is because in, in the beginning, when the process was started, the commission was a bit hesitant uh, about it. How the time went by, how more and more countries got involved in the process, somehow also the commission sought the benefit of it. So my question is, uh, is there an added value that the Commission sees uh, from the process? Thank you very much and good morning uh, to all. And uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to, the, to, this, uh, to be part of this uh, panel and, and I very much uh, look forward to the discussions today. Well, maybe let me start uh, with a clarification because um, I think that the Commission has in fact been a part of this process and supporting this process from the very beginning. When the Berlin process started in 2014, there was a a very, uh, let's say, close integration with the work that we were doing on the content connectivity front. Um, and that was very much also at the core of the Berlin process. But looking at the added value and how we see it today, um, uh, I will complement a little bit on what Alexander said, because certainly uh, we fully agree with his uh, uh, assessment. Uh, and, and starting indeed from the objectives, because you know, going beyond the details, there were essentially two main uh, macro level objectives. One uh, was to um, uh, help the partners in the region 
sit around one table to strengthen the regional cooperation and then on the other side for you to engage uh, with and help the region modernizing itself uh, in preparation for joining uh, the European Union. So, uh, and on both fronts, certainly we have seen a lot of uh, development and the process certainly has contributed uh, to that. Um, the focus has been on uh, uh, engagement and regional cooperation um, and not, of course, uh, uh, on uh, the accession process. And maybe that is where uh, your comment on the role of the Commission and the vision of the Commission, uh, there was rather an element, let's say, of institutional dimension, because obviously not all member states participate in the process. Um, uh, and therefore, there was obviously a, an institutional dimension also to, to handle. But certainly, we have been always very uh, clearly supportive uh, of, uh, uh, of this uh, process. Um, we clearly saw it as useful uh, as an instrument for high level political dialogue, in particular, because at the time, there were not EU Western Balkan summits taking place. So this was a very good um, instrument also to have this uh, political uh, dialogue um, and then of course on the on the substance of uh, of uh, uh, the agenda there was a discussion when we look strictly speaking at the original connectivity agenda so basically focusing on transported energy uh, clearly uh, there is basically on uh, implementation one billion euro project that have leverage um, 3.7 billion euro in investments. So, so the, the impact is clearly just by looking at these figures and of course looking at the project that are being implemented. I mean, this is clearly um, something of a ten very tangible nature. But I also look at it in terms of, you know, whether the building process has delivered from the point of view also of the ambition of the agenda. Because if you look at the agenda of 2014 and you look at the agenda today, the agenda of today has, has obviously, and the scope has obviously developed a lot. What we are looking now uh, is uh, um, the, the digital agenda. It has been mentioned already a couple of times, a very concrete achievement, the uh, Rome like at home uh, regime that will enter into force in a month time. Um, we look at uh, the common green future. So basically even before uh, we started on the, uh, on, on the EU Green Deal, we had clearly put on the table um, the, 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 the green agenda. Um, but then looking at the regional uh, um, economic area, which is now as turning to the common regional market, again, a different level of ambition there, um, with the intention of uh, uh, working on building a common uh, regional market, making essentially the region much more attractive also uh, to uh, the European Union, and therefore um, helping bridging the, also the economic gap that exists, and, that, and therefore accelerating uh, uh, all that. There is obviously the people connectivity dimension, uh, and there again, some of the uh, achievements have already been mentioned, let me not uh, uh, repeat on that. And of course, in there, uh, let me also flag the very important role, of course, that the civil society uh, plays um, uh, throughout the different themes of the, pro uh, of the process. Um, uh, but, uh, but clearly um, helping, let's say, putting also certain issues uh, of importance to uh, the agenda uh, of the building process on the table of the leaders of the region. Um, one uh, additional uh, point that I think demonstrates also how we clearly um, have recognized the importance uh, uh, of what the Berlin process has delivered is the connection with the economic investment plan. A lot of the uh, issues that are on the table of the Berlin process have now been integrated into the economic investment plan that was launched last uh, October, which has essentially the same objective of, of closing the socioeconomic gap uh, with the EU much faster, with a, a big also uh, financial investment of 9 billion euro, which is, is expected to leverage in 20 billion euro. So there are obviously connections, while the two processes obviously are in one way uh, separated, um, the accession process and the Berlin process, but there are obviously very strong interconnections and those inter interconnections are also becoming more and more uh, prominent. And like uh, so uh, to conclude, uh, um, it's, uh, it is in light of all of these elements and therefore a very positive assessment of what the Berlin process has delivered that we are certainly looking at the future and we are certainly ready also to play a role. As Alexander said, the future is still a little bit under discussion, but we are certainly willing to play a role in the future while of course valuing very much the, the ownership of, uh, of the region.
Okay, if I can, if I, if I can sum up, and that was also in direction of my second question, uh, that the commission is quite positive to continue uh, to continue to contribute to the to the process in the period uh, to come. Because my question was also the interplay between the, this intergovernmental process and the accession process. The whole idea in, in the beginning was to get the enlargement back on track and what it, once it is back on track then to, to, to stop the process as such we have seen it uh, the way in with the new methodology with envisages annual eu western balkan summit as you have mentioned but we haven't still seen uh, how it's going to be implemented because we don't have the first countries that should have started the, the, the accession according to the new methodology actually starting but it is good to hear that the european commission is is happy to contribute uh, and uh, continue with the support under the, the, the current uh, circumstances. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, Tanya, uh, there are many obviously uh, what we have heard from uh, Ms. Matuela, but also from, uh, from Mr. Jung, there are many benefits that the Berlin process brought to the Western Balkan region. Can you elaborate a bit more on how is this seen from the lenses of the, from the perspective of the regional uh, cooperation council, but not only uh, in the name of the council, but also in the name uh, of other regional initiatives which are or were under uh, your umbrella. So can you elaborate a bit more on that? Thank you very much, Zoran, and uh, I'm grateful that I have uh, a floor to discuss such an important issue as the the Berlin process and something that I like to call actually Berlin a key, using and borrowing some of the words from the EU terminology. So not in terms of the law from the Berlin process, but those things that are inherited and built during the Berlin process, which, uh, as Michaela said, uh, will have to uh, continue its functioning. If you allow me, and I will really try to be very brief, let us go back in 2014. Alex will uh, remember the time uh, we were discussing that uh, both in Belgrade, uh, what actually the process uh, is bringing to each and every of six of us. Uh, and there was a lot of negative uh, assessments uh, including myself, I have to admit at that time, because there was a, a not very clear picture, is it going to jeopardize the um, just started negotiation process for Serbia, as well as for uh, uh, Montenegro? Is it going to bring some added value to the negotiation? Is it quid pro quo? Is it the replacement of the accession discussion? or we are just talking about money for the uh, projects that uh, will be available to connect uh, uh, Western Balkan 6. So actually it proved to be very, um, um, uh, very vivid, uh, but also um, uh, very evolutionary process. As uh, Michaela noticed, a lot of agenda has been developed. That's why I'm calling this the uh, Berlin Key. We started with uh, uh, several projects uh, which supposed to connect and now we are talking about the common regional market with a view as a stepping stone towards including Western Balkan 6 uh, uh, to the um, European common uh, uh, internal, uh, internal market. The bottom line is actually that the process proved to be resilient in terms of introducing and promoting introduction of the European standards, regardless of the level of uh, EU accession process. So something that could resemble the energy community uh, work, that means that we all of us, Western Balkan 6, we start introducing the um, uh, a harmonization in the region, which is supposed to come only in the later stages of the accession process. Some of those areas has been uh, um, pointed out by Alex and Michaela. Uh, so it's not only goods, 
trade in goods or exchange in goods, but also services, which means the recognition of qualification and diplomas, which means um, allowing the uh, uh, normal way of commuting for the people, so movement of people. Uh, and that's how we reach to the level that we are now discussing how to um, conclude the agreement on or uh, negotiate the agreement on the traveling uh, only using uh, ID all around the region. But the second very important thing is that the Berlin process did not jeopardize uh, ongoing processes for necessary political uh, discussions like the dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina. Uh, so use the example of traveling with the ID. We, of course, we, uh, meaning RCC, as we are um, um, giving the support to the negotiation to reaching this uh, and coordinating the negotiation to reach in this agreement, of course, that we are very cautious not to jeopardize the dialogue which is going under the auspice of the European External Action Service. So uh, uh, also the um, sensitivity of the Berlin process to the ongoing processes is, uh, is extremely uh, important to have, uh, uh, to have in mind. And uh, uh, last but certainly not least, um, uh, very uh, good cooperation between ongoing developments within the European Union, with being the new methodology and the investment plan, with the um, usage from the Berlin process and the participants uh, of the Berlin process, for sure, we are going to discuss much more how actually the common regional market uh, coincide with the investment plan and also other activities in the uh, integration of each and every of the Western Balkan six. And finally, that the process has, I could not agree more with, I think it was Mihaela saying that actually the first, the foremost important element of the Berlin process was together, all together to sit and to discuss the issues. Now we are seeing development of different initiatives. From time to time, we cannot understand, for instance, how mini Schengen and Berlin process uh, are they going hand in hand. But generally speaking, the Berlin process listened very carefully those smaller in political initiatives by some of the leaders in the region and try to uh, introduce it and also make it much more conclusive. So uh, inclusive, sorry. So I don't have also uh, um, uh, um, a glass ball to see how the process is going to develop further, but I have no doubts that we now see, and this is the, the, the most important uh, um, uh, conclusion that I would like to have, much more ownership from the Western Balkan Six that we could envisage at the beginning of the process back in 2014. And, if, if it is only that, we should start building on this. Okay. Uh, re regardless if the process continues or not, uh, the, 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 the process created certain legacy in terms of concrete actions and activities. Four out of six flagship initiatives for the, for the Western Balkan in the credible enlargement perspective are directly related to the Berlin process. Many of the elements which are part of the Berlin process are also part of the uh, economic and investment plan, as Michael already mentioned. So therefore, my question would be, what will happen with this legacy? How we are going to continue further? Well, that is the obligation of us, regional organizations, regarding if it is RCC, uh, and, uh, SEFTA, TCT, uh, RAICO, and so many others like um, the Southeast Europe Health Network, which is becoming extremely important uh, as the initiative uh, building on uh, uh, upgrading the level of the health protection and also exchanging. So um, we've got the obligation. We took the obligation according to the documents that were endorsed, but but our role is to coordinate the implementation. The job is in the hands of the Western Balkan Six. As let me remind 
all of us. Actually, SOFIA declaration is the acknowledgement of the common regional market by six leaders, by six economies of the Western Balkans. And we are there to assist. That's why I urge on ownership uh, sentiment and the ownership uh, element within the process, regardless how this process is going to be uh, known. So um, 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 let, me, let me reiterate, I think that people now understand that the regional cooperation, even the regional integration, if I may use stronger word than just, than just uh, uh, cooperation, uh, is for the benefits of its own. So that means that uh, it's not only that it leads towards the membership to the European Union, but we can even hear that the uh, leaders of the Western Balkan six are using regional integration as the extremely important tool. And also according to the Balkan barometer, 70, up to 70% of citizens of the Western Balkans are very open to the regional integration and cooperation, of course, not neglecting the European integration process for each and every of us. Okay. Uh, th thank you for thank you, thank you, for, thank you, for, thank you for that. Um, uh, just to remind the participants that they can uh, already post uh, post question in the Q and A uh, session. The floor will be uh, section. the The floor will be open uh, after uh, Alexandra's uh, welcoming welcoming remarks. So uh, please post questions, and uh, so the panelists can uh, respond to them uh, afterwards. We we plan to to finish the the whole panel in, in, in more than half an, an hour. Um, also to remind the participants that uh, they can click on, on the cafe where they will find the, uh, the networking tool for the coffee breaks that might, it will be interesting for them to, to check it out. Uh, it would be great that this, although we are in this virtual uh, setting to meet and network with other participants uh, other participants of this civil society and think tank uh, forum. Moving to the to the last uh, speaker, uh, Alexandra, uh, the European Fund for the Balkans uh, ha has been engaged in the Berlin process since its inception. Uh, because of your support, each and every year the participation of the civil society in the process grew proportionally to the inclusion. Uh, in, uh, in, in the process, finishing with civil society or think tank representatives elaborating the recommendation as here will be the case to the ministries of foreign affairs, as well as discussing uh, issues of importance on, on joint panels with, with ministers. So my question to you would be, are you satisfied with the results? Did the civil society manage to push the positive agenda forward through this process? The floor is yours. It can be a very brief answer, but I will try to elaborate a bit. Well, <clears throat> the Berlin process started without the civil society involvement, and this was added one year later than in Vienna. And from then it was a part of the process itself. And then after Italy and Trieste, it was even taken up by the organizers themselves. So it's really in this sense, a positive development that civil society has been uh, recognized and has been included. Um, in Vienna, it started uh, with the ministers of foreign affairs because the Balkans in Europe policy advisory group drafted a declaration on bilateral issues that was signed at that time by the ministers of foreign affairs. I think that is one of the reasons why the connection civil society forum and ministries of foreign affairs was, was made. Um, no question that it is important to have gatherings like this. Um, I'm very much aware how much work, effort, time, and last but not least, money it takes to, to organize these events. Um, Zoran, you know that we were fighting also to keep the format alive uh, during last year when, when the pandemic was still different and it was not common to have these kind of events also online. So no doubt there. But you asked me for the results. 
And there, uh, the situation is not very bright. And I don't know, somehow lately when I'm in panels, I'm always the party breaker because I somehow see the things a bit different than they were just uh, mentioned by my by the previous speakers of this panel. So um, first about the setup, I think that uh, connecting civil society with foreign ministers meetings is symbolism, which is important, of course. But I remember that in Poznan, when, where I was present, it was seven of us uh, representing the regional civil society. These people are chief diplomats. Of course, they were listening to us. And of course, they were polite. And of course, nothing happened. Um, coming from the Balkans, uh, to be heard or to be listened, I don't know if we have been heard, but at least they listened to us. And coming from the Western Balkans, this is already a lot. Because locally here, um, we don't even have that any longer. So this part of symbolism is very important. If other colleagues show that your civil society is important, this might maybe at least trigger something uh, locally. And here is what uh, where I was listening carefully when I heard the terms ownership and how the Berlin process will develop. If it's complete local ownership, then this additional um, and the added value and, and this additional symbolism the civil society forum had for civil society will be lost. Uh, we have to make that clear because um, that, that's, that's a sad fact. Um, looking at the eight, uh, at the past years, um, where are we? Um, it was the, the fear that the Berlin process, I mean, the Berlin process started as a harm reduction, as Lauren, you said, that uh, after the statement made by the then president that there will be no enlargement under his mandate, from harm reduction to fears that the process will jeopardize accession negotiations. Well, at least this fear is gone because we don't have accession negotiations. We have a process that is, that is basically stuck. So at least there is no fear on that side. Um, we have the situation that the whole region now uh, is um, placed as hybrid regimes, even the two so-called front runners in the EU, EU accession process, Montenegro and Serbia, have been downgraded from partly free democracies to hybrid regimes. Uh, we have severe issues with media freedom and safety of journalists and even safety of civil society um, representatives. We have an enormous problem of emigration that in some part is uh, close to depopulation. We have tremendous levels of air pollution. We are the most polluted region uh, on this continent. And um, even the European Commission speaks about state capture in their report. So this is the reality we are facing. And although all the economic successes that have been mentioned are definitely there, but economic success with worsening social outcomes is really a questionable success. So the picture I'm drawing uh, of the last eight years and also on the present, uh, I fear are a bit darker than, um, than what we have heard, but that's what makes a good panel, the balance. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, uh, my follow-up question would be, what more uh, could we have done to enable better results? I think that, uh, as I said, a lot of work went into preparing. Um, we had regional meetings, we had involved different foundations and donors apart from the organizers. There was the Erste the Foundation, the Friedrich Ebert, the Heinrich Bill Foundation. There were regional civil society meetings. There was even for a couple of years, the Think Tank Forum was, was in a different format. So really a lot of knowledge has been produced and a lot of knowledge is there. And then this big summit happened and it is important and we see now after a year of zooming, we see how important it is to actually get together. And we are all looking forward to actually get together physically. Um, sometimes it's even if it's just the aspect of group therapy, you see that you're not alone and that others are fighting the same problems that all that's already a lot, but that's not enough. And I think that here more could have been done and maybe that's something we, we, we might think of uh, how it goes further, the follow-up, what happens to the recommendations, um, 
Involving civil society into regional decision making is important, but we now see that civil society is more and more excluded from national decision making processes, which is much more important. Y you all know why I don't have to elaborate on that. So I think that that this part of uh, facing the new reality we have, and this is in, in many countries increased state capture, is something that we have to address also on this uh, regional format and to see how we can decapture the states. And also one comment, uh, the economic and financial plan has been mentioned. What we fear here is that um, ways have to be found to organize spending and implementation in a way that structures of state capture will not be strengthened additionally with this for, for, for here really big amounts of money. So I think it's the follow up. So we have mastered the organization, the consultation, the drafting of the conclusions, but what, where we have to have a stronger focus is, is the follow up. Okay, so moving away from structure and focusing on the substance uh, itself. Yes. Uh, moving, moving to the, to the Q&A question, uh, to Q&A se uh, section, uh, we have four questions. Uh, uh, two of them are uh, concrete with specifically asking uh, panelists to respond. The other two, there are no, oh, you have to direct the question to someone or at least to say, so please, can you uh, redesign your questions and ask specifically uh, uh, whom do you want to uh, pose the question? Uh, the first one, uh, the first question is directed to, uh, to Alexander and uh, Michaela. It's from our good friend from Tirana, Ardian Hachkai. Uh, there are actually two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, as per your assessment, has the Perlin process uh, 1.0 had an impact on the Southeast European Six progress in the fundamentals? That's the first question. And the second one, would you see development? Uh, would you see development in that regard uh, for the economic and investment plan and uh, the 10 flagship uh, initiatives? So these are questions directed to uh, Alexander and Michaela. And, uh, and there is a question by uh, Milena Lazarevic uh, to all panelists. Uh, she's interested in interested in your assessment as to why the Berlin process has failed to support consolidation of democracy in the region, although it has strengthened regional cooperation in concrete policy areas. Shall so, I start? Yeah, Michaela, you can you can start definitely. If you don't mind, I would actually like to address them a little bit together because somehow they are part of the same issue. And, and I think I would like to start by clarifying a fundamental uh, point also from uh, maybe the previous discussion that also came up uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the replies given also by the other panelists. Um, the Berlin process is not, as uh, Tanya correctly uh, said, is not an alternative, a replacement of the accession process. This is a very, very important point. It is a very important complement, is a substantial important complement, but it's not a replacement, which means that the two processes are basically gone ahead uh, in, in parallel, hand in hand. We are not talking here about, uh, you know, uh, also putting expectations on the Berlin process that were never meant to be part of the objectives. Um, uh, such as, uh, you know, uh, at least part of the work on, on the fundamentals. We are looking more and more at the interconnection. I think that the uh, economic and investment plan actually makes a little bit more the connection because one of the priority areas remains also, for instance, uh, uh, rule of law. Now, it's not the focus of, um, of that. We are trying to basically build on what we are doing in terms of uh, uh, connectivity, uh, green agenda, digitalization, uh, uh, filling the economic, the socioeconomic gap, 
And then, of course, at the same time, continuing the process of accession, where, of course, as you know, there is a, a very important focus on um, rule of law, and even more so um, with the new methodology, where not only in the scope of the definition of the different clusters of the negotiations, but also in terms of the dynamic of the negotiations, uh, it will be even more important than, than it has been uh, so far um, uh, to progress on the rule of law in general, rule of law, democracy, public administration. So basically the first cluster um, of the negotiations in order to move ahead overall with the, with the negotiation process. So, uh, so this is the first important point that we need to, we need to, to clarify. And let me also make another important point in terms of the uh, overall perspective. Um, I heard the expression such as, you know, the, the enlargement process, the accession process is stuck. Well, it, I look at it a little bit differently, knowing, of course, that there are obviously, and there have been uh, challenges. One of the things that we have done in parallel to the Berlin process that are progress and, and had a very important evolution, as we have discussed before, we have done the same on the accession process. The revised methodology is exactly a recognition of the fact that there was need to create a new dynamic in the enlargement uh, process. And we have proposed this methodology, member states have uh, adopted the, the methodology. This methodology now has been accepted also by Serbia and Montenegro, and we are in the process of formalizing this step. And we are, um, and we have worked very hard uh, to uh, also help Albania and North Macedonia move to the next step. Now, if we look at the perspective, we are actually close to have four negotiating countries soon. Now, I've been working on the enlargement policy now for about 20 years. It's the first, first time after many years that we will basically, uh, you know, that we are considering preparing negotiations for, for countries. So to say that the process is stuck, uh, I think that, uh, you know, doesn't reflect fully uh, the discussion that are taking place. This is not, of course, to deny that there have been very difficult discussions, of course, with member states, and there are many different positions, uh, but certainly the reverse methodology has helped reconciling the position, and we are basically now in a different uh, path, basically, to, to, to move ahead also uh, with that. So it's very important that we don't mix the two processes. Now, I can elaborate further on some of the specific aspects, but maybe for the sake of shortness, I'll stop here. Uh, that's the main point I wanted to make, but I can come back, of course, with some of the more specific points, uh, if you wish. Alexander? Thank you. And yeah, I think Michela gave an excellent uh, answer to, to most of the aspects. I just wanted to make, therefore, an addendum on, uh, in principle, how the process also contributes to discussing issues like rule of law and fundamentals. So as I think uh, Tanya first made the point about the value of sitting around the table, I think uh, there are many tables that have been created now with the Berlin process on many different levels. So um, there is, of course, the political levels of uh, foreign ministers and ministers of interiors who, of course, when they sit together, they uh, also have political discussions and uh, issues like that, that normally are more in a bilateral context are then also in, in such a context. But what I would also like to mention is RICO here again and other forms that have been created because there um, and also the more close connections between civil society and just the fact that we will get of course your feed in from uh, from here and that will be heard that is something where um, I think the the issues which are pressing um, get more connection to each other's between the, the countries that are uh, involved but they all also get some some publicity on that. That is something I wanted to add on. Okay, uh, maybe uh, uh, Tanya and Alexandra, maybe you can reflect a little bit on why the Berlin process have failed to support consolidation of democracy in the region, vis-a-vis okay. -vis the strengthened regional cooperation in concrete uh, policy areas. Okay. Uh, Milena's question, I saw it. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity, but I will start um, from um, uh, repeating Michaela's uh, sentence that actually we have to be aware of the fact that the enlargement process and the Berlin process have a different aims. So the enlargement process is actually the process that 
um, was meant to be, it is, and it's going to continue to be um, the, the one for helping to the country to build the institutions that will provide and respect the democracy and the rule of law. It was not the aim of the Berlin process. So um, it, it, it is important to, to uh, constantly repeat that. But on the other hand, by introducing some of the regional activities into the uh, um, uh, during the Berlin process development of agenda, we also noticed that some of the issues of building the stable democratic institutions and the rule of law is can be um, uh, supported not of course replaced, but supported through the Berlin process. As for instance, um, um, not going into the economic uh, uh, issues like uh, trying to align standards for the foreign direct investments uh, is one of the issue, but also working jointly on the public procurement uh, uh, development in the region. That's part of the negotiation process. That's part of pure fight against corruption, which is actually one of must uh, within the issues of the democratic of the uh, of the society. Um, one thing that we also did, um, it was um, it was also RCC work. Uh, that is a uh, um, um, working closely with the judges and the prosecutors and sh sharing the experiences, which is an enormously important element of independence and professionalism of the judges and the prosecutors in our societies, which is one part that is neglected in the development of the uh, of the rule of law. So. Berlin process could not do things which are which were not the objective, but could add and um, in some instances he the process or we all added something which will help building uh, the stable democratic institutions and fulfill uh, the desperate need for developing rule of law in our societies. Alexandra. Well, I, I think we, 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 as Tanya said, we have to remain realistic on what was the Berlin process meant to, to be. And there it definitely added and contributed to so much needed regional cooperation. And I think that, uh, that there we really have moved quite, quite away in so many important areas. And that, that's definitely something that, that is thanks to the Berlin process. Uh, it was never mandated to help democratize the, the countries. I think that is really something that was expected from the accession process, from certain chapters, from the political criteria. And the question is why that has not been delivered and why those two countries that were part of, that were negotiating have been backsliding there. Um, over the last years, the term stabilocracy, meaning that stability has been put over democracy has been placed. So I think that the answer needs to be needs to be uh, looked after in that uh, sphere more. Um, what Tanya just said about public procurement and, and, and judges and, uh, and, and prosecution independence, well, we know at least for, for some countries that especially big investment projects completely go beyond public procurement rules where you make intergovernmental special contracts that completely put out of, out of question all national uh, laws. So this is a big problem that has to be addressed, also looking at the geopolitics of it. And just uh, these days, the, the report of the European Commission on the state of uh, the judiciary in, in Serbia came out with, with a lot of really negative um, comments and, and, and and screening. So um, again, I, I'm, I'm really not sharing any optimism here. And I think that the democratization issue is here to stay. It's not only a Western Balkan things. Uh, it's also a EU um, challenge and a global challenge. Um, but for us here, it's definitely here to stay. Does anyone else want to reflect on this question? If not, we can we can. Um... So maybe 
maybe yeah. very briefly, uh, let me bring it back to the um, revised methodology. There has been obviously an evolution throughout the years. And again, if you look at uh, uh, the fifth enlargement and you look at the enlargement today in terms of the methodology, there has been a, a, an important evolution. Um, there are uh, new instruments that have been put in the new methodology and those instruments are there for a reason. There has obviously been a recognition of the fact that there is need to reinforce um, certain uh, um, instruments to be able to respond to the challenges that we have uh, seen. Having said that, um, uh, you know, the, the, we need to look at all these instruments uh, together. Um, we should not uh, have uh, expectations, of course, uh, from uh, the uh, Berlin process or the future of the Berlin process when it comes to, um, uh, let's say, the, the overall connectivity agenda to tackle um, uh, the um, uh, you know, the challenges in terms of rural law, democratization, et cetera. At the same time, of course, we are not uh, uh, pursuing that agenda in a vacuum. We are not blind and we are not, uh, let's say, ignoring the connections between the investments component and uh, the um, uh, need to advance on uh, other reforms, whether it is rule of law, or whether are those reforms that are more strictly connected to uh, the implementation of the of the, um, for instance, connectivity agenda. Uh, the public procurement aspect that Tanya has uh, mentioned is very important. And we are fully aware that there are, let's say, procurements that happen uh, outside the procurement rules, but that is not the case for the funding that we are providing. That is also an important point. There are, of course, uh, an element of competition when it comes to investments in the region. And one of the reasons why there is this competition is exactly because we are insisting on having the compliance with public procurement rules. And that is where also we need to be very much uh, aware and of course push very much in this direction. And that is also where now there is an important investment for which the countries have, is, have obviously a very strong interest. And we are talking about 9 billion euros, but they, the countries also know very well, our partners know very well that this comes with certain conditions in terms of implementation. Public procurement being obviously one of those. Okay, uh, thank you for that, uh, that that clarification. That was also <clears throat> one of the question in, in questions uh, in, in the chat. As we need to finish in uh, one and a half minute, uh, I would just ask you if you have some final thoughts. Uh, there are also other questions in the chat. We will find a way, we will coordinate with the organizers how these questions will be answered. But for the time being, I think we have uh, used our time efficiently. If you have some other final thoughts you want to share uh, on, on this panel, maybe about the future, now you have the time, at least a minute to do so. I would. Please do. Well, the challenges are increasing and uh, despite all the processes, summits and so on that are being added, uh, which from summit to summit, from organization to organization, question is, who has time to implement anything. But in any case, the challenges are growing and especially we as civil society uh, have to stay alert um, and um, we, we have to see from where we get the, the, the necessary support. And I hope we stay with support and not with protection needed soon because the situation on the ground is really worrisome in, in a number of our countries. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Maybe some, someone else from the panel? Tanya? Yes, uh, let us continue, uh, so reverse order. Let us continue uh, with what uh, uh, Alexandra pointed out, the importance of the civil society um, 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 as um, not only uh, the platform or the forum that is going to observe the reform process both at the national but uh, also regional level, but as uh, one of the most important player uh, of the reform process, uh, again, both at the national and uh, regional level. Yes, um, I can agree that uh, um, 
there, there was not usage of the full, full potential of the civil society. But again, as Alexandra said, uh, uh, the development started even before in terms of introducing uh, the words and also the opinion of the civil society. Some of the agendas were shaped according to the opinion of the civil society. That is also something that has to be uh, um, um, added. Um, and I can also vouch at least for some of the regional countries that the civil society platforms are heavily involved. Um, not only in terms uh, uh, of uh, working together in uh, introducing European standards, which are equally important for both regional cooperation for the common regional market, as well as the European integration process, but also undertook uh, the uh, responsibility of some of the implementation, let me remind you, uh, for the chapter 23. Is that perfect? No, far away from being perfect. And it's not never going to be perfect. It's not possible, really. But the, the, what it is extremely important is that uh, uh, national authorities, as well as the regional one, I'm speaking now on, uh, on behalf of the RCC, use the capacity, knowledge, experience of the civil society platforms and organization, both re regional and national, for upgrading uh, what has been uh, achieved. One of the examples for us is, for instance, Green Agenda that we are doing the last week, we had uh, a very good regional uh, uh, exchange uh, uh, in, uh, in that respect. And we are going to continue doing, insisting on uh, uh, doing like this. So I can agree with Alexandra, it's not perfect. There is a big struggle, but I am happy that we have here, but also not only here, all around us, very skillful people, our dear friends and colleagues, very ready to be critical yet constructive, which is the most important. Important. Thank you very much, Zoran. Okay. Uh, before giving the floor to, to, to Michela, uh, yeah, I will just use the words of, of, of State Minister Roth. You know, he, he encouraged us to be creative. And these are finding ways how we can uh, engage further on in the process, or regardless if the process is or, or, or not, or any version of it. But also, we remain critical, not only to the work of our governments in the region, but also what member states and the commission can do more, more bravely, more constructively in order to push our own authorities to move forward on many of the uh, reform agendas. So Michaela, the floor is yours. Please be short, we will finish with Alexander, final thoughts, and then uh, we move to the co virtual coffee break. Uh, thank you very much. I think it, it looks like we had more or less the same thoughts at the end of this uh, conversation and uh, and I'm an optimist, so I tend to be positive. So I would like to finish a little bit with a positive uh, uh, note. But uh, but of course, as it has been said, being positive uh, doesn't mean that uh, we uh, believe that, uh, and also saying that the Berlin process has delivered uh, on a certain things does not mean that the, the work is finished. Of course, there is more to do. There are, of course, still many challenges ahead. Um, some will have to be addressed by the enlargement process. Some um, can be certainly um, uh, address or you know uh, the building process can help addressing uh, others uh, or the future of the building process so let me just use an anecdote a little bit on this uh, because uh, uh, i remember when in 2012 or 13 before the Berlin process, we were organizing as commission meetings of the western balkan six in this kind of forum at the time it was something exceptional and the agenda was very light because the simple fact that there was a meeting of the leaders was an achievement in itself. So now we are talking about regular meetings that happen very often in different uh, ways. Um, and the agenda is becoming more and more ambitious. So, you know, what I'm trying to say here is that there is clearly an evolution on that. Clearly, we are also talking about, you know, elements of, uh, you know, working together uh, in the region that we are clearly in a different setup. Still many challenges ahead, but I think let's not forget where, where also we are coming from. And uh, obviously uh, a lot to do. Uh, we all have, of course, our respective roles, 
So let's work together to uh, to move ahead, and not only, of course, uh, on the building process, but more in general on all the elements of regional cooperation, good neighbourly relations, reconciliation, that obviously have a very important role also in the enlargement process. And thank you very much for all your questions and the discussions. Alexander? Thank you. Yeah, so I just want to conclude by saying that uh, my colleagues and I, of course, will try to make a contribution in the in the weeks ahead with all the um, with all the ministerial meetings with the summit in the end that will come. It is something um, where and there I would like to thank particularly Alexandra for also shaking up a, a bit maybe sometimes when um, we were mentioning what has been achieved and when uh, we were mentioning where there are plans and when you uh, remind us that plans also need to be fulfilled this is exactly the role of uh, civil society that's what we expect and when i look at the agenda and the, see the issues from a to j um, for today, then uh, you have a, a very long working plan ahead, and I can reassure you that uh, yeah, I will be very much looking forward, and not only me, but uh, of course the decision makers will be very um, yeah very interested in your contributions, and uh, that uh, was already a very good start. And uh, looking forward to what comes out from uh, from your very intensive discussions today. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much from my side, and I, I think that I can talk on behalf of all the participants. Thank you for the uh, great presentations and the discussion, and uh, looking forward to uh, working with you in the period to come. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a good discussion in the rest of the day. Bye. 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 Bye.